Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo, discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Quick note this week, Dave Bittner will not be joining us because uh, sadly his mother passed away this week, so he's off dealing with some family issues as uh, you'd expect. So... We, uh, we are thinking about you, Dave. Many condolences, and uh, hope to hear you back soon. Yes, to the whole Bittner clan. It's, uh, it's a tough time, having been through that myself relatively recently. So, yep. Uh, speaking of age, though, mm-hmm. I, we are recording this on April 28th on Thursday, as we usually do. And the episode officially comes out Friday, April 29th, when I will be as old as Wilford Brimley was when Cocoon was released. <laughs> Believe it or not. Believe it or not, I, I this made me start to think a little bit. When we started doing this podcast, I was still in my 30s. Then I was in my 40s. <laughs> yes. We've been doing this for quite some time. Um, age is not what it used to be. I mean, I know people say that all the time, but it's really true. Like, I look at pictures of my even just my parents or my grandparents at similar age to me, and boy, they looked old. That's one of the one of the differences. They definitely had a harder 50. But as I, I was mentioning this to my dad, because he'd never heard of the Brimley cocoon line. And uh, he's like, well, Wilford Brimley got the big house because when he was 30, he could play 50. When he was 50, he could play 90. You know? Yeah. I uh, finally caught up to him. Yeah. Not the best line you want to cross, but uh, congratulations, Jason. You made it. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's it's kind of the last, the last hurrah until I'm like 75. So it's well... Have some fun. Yes, I will be 18,530 days old. All Yay. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. If you hear any noise coming from me, uh, we'll see. We'll see how those filters work. But uh, there's something going on uh, at my house that I didn't even know existed until about a week ago. Uh, my wife mentioned to me, uh, you know, spring is springing here and it's uh, time to wheel out the barbecue. And she mentioned, oh, well, we we really need to get that cleaned first. So I originally just kind of pictured in my head, well, there goes my Saturday afternoon. I'm going to be outside tearing apart my barbecue, scraping it down and cleaning it. And she's like, I booked it. I'm like, what? There what? are professional <laughs> barbecue cleaners here. I did not know that was a thing. Oh, give me a break. So yeah, somebody is here at my house right now tearing apart my barbecue. Uh, they even already scraped down some of the metal and like, it's it's a, it's a thing, man. And I had no idea. You are so bougie. You ah. are so bougie. Yes, I know. I know. Uh, it's a thing. It's there. There are multiple companies, not just one. It's a it's a full blown thing here. So okay. I'm having my barbecue cleaned as we speak. But what made me <laughs> what made me put that in here? Maybe sure think about it. <laughs> um, is is this whole coming out of the pandemic? Uh, you know, flexible work thing. I never. I don't know how we would have been able to get this done. Otherwise, we would have had to book on the weekend. I suppose when they're very popular. Um. I, I just I was thinking a lot about this because the articles are coming fast and furious, particularly there's a big push right now. Like I, I just keep seeing articles saying the five day work week is coming back and you better brace for it. In my mind, no, it, that ship has sailed. And again, we are talking <laughs> it's been of, the seven day work week for quite some time now. Yeah, it, it, we're in a seven day work week working all the time from home. That's the deal. Um mm-hmm. You know, and again, this is kind of a bougie topic because when we talk about this, and I think we've mentioned this before, we're talking about a very select few group of people. If you're, if you're, you know, retail, if you're customer service, if you're anything of that, you're, you've been going to work. You're going to work. There's no option to work from home. So it's a very upper middle classy kind of thing that uh, it's only certain people that this applies to, but it seems to be taking up so much oxygen. And, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how to do this with the company that I'm at right now, trying to get people back into the office. I, it's never going to be a five day work week again. That's, that's just never going to happen because the flexibility and the lack of, um, you know, having to, to get to work and the hours that that takes away, you know, having to do that every single day is, is just, you're never going to convince people to do that, especially if there are companies that are offering the option not to. And I think people just need to kind of give up that ghost. But having said that, I mean, I actually like being in the office. I, I enjoy going. There are two main obstacles that keep me from going in basically 24 7. Well, not 24 7. You know what I mean. <laughs> You'd like to be there 24 <laughs> uh, 7. Childcare, because childcare, I'm not sure how people did it before. I, I know that, you know, there were a lot more options before. Things are slowly starting to come back, but that's a real issue, uh, you know, and, and, <laughs> 
it's just it's crazy and the other the other thing was something i touched upon we were talking about a little bit about it last week is i can go into the office i'm going into the office three days a week right now which is great i can sit and i talk to a couple people and and we have that in-person bouncing back and forth thing which is very key i i really enjoy it but how long are you spending at the office when you go i i do basically half day like i need to be out by like two to be able to go pick up my kid so I'll go in from nine. Gotcha. So usually, you're doing three half days a week. I'm doing three half days a week in the office. And I'd like to ramp that yeah. up a little bit more. We'll see what happens. But the problem with it is three days right now is enough given the people that are actually coming in. Like I find myself after I've had my discussion with, with one or two people that are actually in the office, I might as well be at home because I'm back on Zoom or doing virtual chats with people because not everybody, everybody else isn't coming into the office. So it's really kind of a weird right. thing. So... Still trying to figure this all out. What a weird world we're in right now. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing basically four to five half days a week in the office because mm -hmm. I love going to the office now. Yeah, it's great, right? It's, yeah, I mean, well, for me, it's, you know, it's a fortress of solitude. No dogs, no roommates, no people, no distractions, just mm -hmm. the people in the office who stick to their own thing. But the, I mean, the weirdest thing is I have not been in an office that is my office ever. Right. So <laughs> when I hear people coming down the hallway... I just reflexively react to, oh, shit, what's due? What am I late on? Who do I owe what to? Right. Because that was my entire office career. Yeah. Somebody. It was always like, oh, God, the boss is going to come and catch me doing something I shouldn't be doing. Right. You know, that was that was life <laughs> in an office. <laughs> or when's the next meeting? I see a bunch of people walking down the hall going to a meeting. I'm like, I wasn't invited. Yeah, where's my like, invite? Oh, shit, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> not your company, you idiot. But I'm so used to that vibe that it's really hard to train. Like, you know, I'm I'm trying to snap myself out of it i'm like this is my domain but i'm like you know you can fuck off if you want to when it's your place but you still have that guilt when somebody walks by it's like oh i could be doing something else <laughs> so strange yeah it is right it is so strange and speaking of office work i did on a lark i applied to uh jada pinkett smith's podcast company Oh, for, she has a whole company well that red table diary thing or whatever the hell it is mm -hmm. uh Red Shoe Talk, I don't know. Red David Shoe Diaries? Is probably naked in it somewhere, yeah. Um, but that's a big that's a big production, man. Right. And uh, they have a whole production company around it with, you know, I think over 100 people work there because they do other stuff. But they were I have alerts on LinkedIn for podcast producer jobs because I just want to see what the, you know, how healthy the market is out there. And it is very healthy. There are a lot of jobs out there for podcasting, but the problem is they're in an office. Yeah. So not going to go, but I just wanted to try it. Sadly, I did get the uh, the blow off email. Um, I'm going to read this. I want you to tell me if you think that this was actually written or if this is just a uh, a form letter, because I have my opinion on it. Jason, thank you for your interest in working at Westbrook, Inc. We applaud your accomplishments. Although you have an impressive background slash experience, we do not have a position that is a strong match with your profile at this time. We will be keeping your resume active in our system and will surely reach out to you if we find openings or if we find an opening matching with your profile. Thanks again for your interest in Westbrook. We hope you will remain enthusiastic about our company and we will look forward to connecting with you in the future. I love that. Uh, we hope you will remain enthusiastic about our company. Right. <laughs> no, this is 100% a form letter. Yeah. Although you have an impressive background slash experience. Slash? Yes. I, I would say sorry, but I also have heard that she's a complete and utter nightmare to work for. So. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I would never take the job, but I wanted the interview. I wanted the story of the interview. Right. You know, and, and they're, they're literally like a mile from my place. So it'd been a, a fun afternoon to pop over and see what it's like on the in, in the belly of the beast right now. Right. Because you know it's weird. You know <laughs> it's just weird. Yeah. I had something fun me and kind of weird happen to me last night as I was scrolling through the Twitter sphere. Um, and I saw somebody made a tweet and my mind just kind of assumed, because obviously I follow a lot of tech and IT people, and I assumed that this must just be one of them because the tweet reads, why on earth would you want people to see your Venmo transactions? And I thought, well, you're a little late to that game. We've been saying that shit for years now. And then I realized it was Sarah Silverman that did it. <laughs> ah, Sarah. Yeah. We're moving that. We're moving the boulder one inch at a time. Yeah. I wish I had more stuff to talk about here because I'm really just trying to avoid talking about Elon Musk and Twitter. In the news. My God, the news cycle. Oh, my oh. God. This can they I just 
it's almost Trumpian now is how much I want Elon Musk out of my life and my news feed, but he's not going anywhere. Uh, he has uh, decided to purchase it. He leveraged a lot of his Tesla shares and money farted out of his butt and who the hell knows. So it's $44 billion, $54.20 per share, which works out for me on my cost basis average of Twitter stock, stock that I had. So I'll be okay with that. Uh, he will take the company private, and he said he's also planning to upgrade Twitter by protecting free speech slash bringing Trump back, open sourcing algorithms, fighting spam bots, and authenticating all humans. Now, I got to yeah. be honest here, except for the Trump yeah. coming back, all of that sounds <laughs> okay. good, but will he actually do yeah. it? That's always the question. You can say you're going to do these things. Are you? Here's the problem. Here's the problem, Brian. We mm -hmm. have just basically swapped one absentee landlord for another one. Well, That's actually, it. it's even worse. I was thinking about that as well. At least Jack was only running one other company. True. How true. many companies does Elon have? Five? So we've traded one stoned absentee landlord for another one that's got even more apartment buildings. Yeah, yeah. This guy is the, the you know, the ultimate slumlord. And everybody's talking about leaving. Oh, I'm going to leave Twitter. Nobody's oh. leaving. And then they're like, but I've spent so much time here. And they, they roll out the sunk tweet fallacy where they think that if they've, they've tweeted this much, then, oh, God, they can't abandon it. I'm like, you can always turn it off. Yeah. So shut up. Either do it or don't. Don't tell me what you're going to do, please. I know you want that dopamine hit, but you're not going to get it. So just shut the fuck up yeah. and tweet on, tweet on. Tweet on. You know, here's the thing. I don't care. Uh, shake it up. Whatever. It's a, it's a website. You know, have at it. Uh, if you want to spend that much money on it, go for it. Yeah. Uh, honestly, the only thing that he can do with Twitter is probably make it better. Yeah. So It can't get worse. Well, it can. Mm -hmm. Bringing Trump back will make it much worse, but. But the news cycle about this is absolutely ridiculous because, I mean, there's a it's it, all the news can be encapsulated in this one headline. No one knows what Musk's Twitter takeover means for the company. That's true. Right. We have no idea. He doesn't even know. No, that's the thing. He doesn't even know. You know, he, he it's his latest new toy. And, you know, as far as like somebody who knows how to use Twitter buying twitter that's at least a good thing because i think he's going to have a lot of the pain points that everybody has so mm -hmm. which he has you know been uh documenting in excruciating detail in his own twitter feed which has been great i i actually unfollowed him i couldn't deal with it anymore i it, it, they just scroll by i'm not even paying attention anymore yeah until until this is over it's going to be a while but you know there's the, there's always here's the one thing that always gets me too is uh, i looked at the you know the the clauses and all that stuff that everybody's talking about from the the buyout contract, and there's that one billion dollar clause that either one of them can you know basically quit. Yeah. Because when you look at the nuts and bolts and the ROI on it, that one billion dollar fine for just saying "ah screw it." Yeah. With all the press that he's got, that might actually be a pretty good deal. That's true. You know, just for you know however many six months this thing can go on, just get the free press and then just say "ah eh, I changed my mind." Well, one person this has not worked out well for so far is Trump because his uh, true social SPAC took a spanking uh, as soon as this was announced and dumped a lot of its value. But he is uh, sticking true to uh, his company right now. He's trying to push that in the news. He says he will not return to Twitter, even if Elon Musk uh, invites him back. Instead, he will use his own true social as the sole platform for his voice. He said on Monday. Can I get that, that in writing, please? He said on Monday that he will formally join his true social over the next seven days as planned. Hold on a second. Oh, yeah. Your business plan <laughs> was to launch your site and then ignore it for months. And then on a random on a on a random next seven days, you're gonna decide that's when that's when I roll myself out on the on my own platform. That's your business plan? Well, no, that's, that's just well. when the text told him that he'll be able to sign up again. <laughs> He's in a queue still. Uh, He's anyways, still in the queue. <laughs> I also don't believe it for a fucking second. As soon as he's allowed back on Twitter, he's going to be there. Oh, God. He's like a hungry man crossing the desert. He's probably reloading. Just reload, 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 reload. reload. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every time the phone rings, is it Elon? Is it Elon? <laughs> Am I back yet? Am I back? We'll see how that goes. Hopefully he'll just keep him off. But uh, I don't see how he can because his whole thing is free speech. That, that, that is the he has stated that that is the reason he is purchasing Twitter, because he does he does not believe in 
he he thinks people are being censored there and he believes in free speech and that's that. So there's no he he can't not let him back on. Like he just can't. So No, he does. He has to let him back on. But the uh, the other thing is, how much fucking freer do you need Twitter to be? I know. Jesus. I mean <laughs> Uh, that I mean, that it was is the, the freest of them all. That was the number one tweet that like everybody felt the need to do is like, finally, I'm free to speak my mind, which I've been able to do the entire time. Well, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I actually have been put in timeout a couple times recently, so maybe he'll get rid of the timeout clause and I can be as mean as I want to be. <laughs> Even though most of the timeouts were me being facetious and a little cunt to myself and they still blocked me. They blocked me from being mean to myself for 24 hours. Well, Way to go, you know, Twitter. Self-care. It's important, Jason. They're just helping you out. Well, it's also that time of the year when we get all of the earnings reports coming out and uh, Meta's earnings report is out and it's just, it's kind of a chuckler. I think. I think this is a mid, mid-level mid chuckler. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Q1, uh, Meta's reality, or yeah, reality Labs, uh, they lost $2.96 billion. Wow. Okay. okay. Last year, they lost $10 billion. So they're so on the upswing. We're talking about real money here. Yeah, we're on track this year to lose, uh, what, $12 billion, So even better. Uh, he's saying that, uh, yeah, we're not going to really see anything until 2030, at least. And it's going to be a very exciting 2030. Uh-huh. This is what happens when you don't have any oversight. He is going to George Lucas the shit out of that company. Yep. Misa think, uh, Misa see that train coming a mile away. Yeah. Yeah. No oversight means you can bet the farm on something that's actually a really bad idea. Yeah. That's, you know, that is the flaw with him being, you know, the benevolent dictator of Facebook. You need to be able to get kicked out for doing dumb shit. I mean, I know he was really trying to change the the face of the company and uh, try and walk away from all of the harm that Facebook has caused by just changing the name, which for the most part seemed to have worked so far. Yeah, it has. Yeah, but he's riding this this rocket into the ground, and it doesn't look like there's anything that's going to like talk any sense into him no. at all. No. I mean, he's got he's got he's got unlimited funds to burn on this. That's the real problem, right? There's there there's no there's no bottom to hit. Until it's just completely right. gone, right? Like, it's just, he's got so much money to play with. Uh, they'll be so deep embedded in this. that They already are to some degree that it's, you know, it's the face of the company now. This is what the company is going to be. And there's no turning back anymore. And Sheryl Sandberg did not, uh, did not do her job. Yeah, no, definitely not. So the interesting thing, I mean, how much did it cost to develop the iPhone? I'm sure it was a hell of a lot less than $13 billion. Yes, but Jason, this is a whole virtual world that's going to replace our real one without pants. Death to pants. Death to pants. Uh, Death to uh, fossil fuels, too, because Ford has produced 2,000, 2,000 of its new uh, F-150s that they're going to be rolling out uh, next week. Most uh, popular vehicle in the world. It is. F-150 is everywhere. So it's, uh, they're, they're really, you know, they got to knock this one out of the park, but I'm just going to say, I really don't want to be at the front of the line because right now they're, they're still doing tweaks to the software before they start rolling out. And yeah, I don't want to be a beta tester on that one. That is our future, Jason. We are all beta testers for everything. We are all beta testers. Mm -hmm. I did see a Rivian in the wild though. They're pretty cool. They're cute. Yeah. They're cute. It's really hard to tell the difference between, from the front between a Rivian and a new Bronco. Right. Of course, I was in, you know, Calabasas, where all the rich kids are. Yeah. It's just great. Uh, except we have a new car on the market now called the Electra Mechanica. Right. This is a, this is a, it's called the Solo. This is a three-wheeled car. Now, Brian, mm-hmm. you and I are fans of Top Gear. Yes. What do we know about the three-wheeled car? They tip over a lot. They tip over a lot, and they've never worked. And... There's, I mean, it's just, you put, try and put three wheels on a car. It is fodder for a Netflix movie of the week. Eventually it's going to be no matter what. The thing about this car is it's called the solo because it only has one seat. Right. And it looks fundamentally wrong when you look at it. <laughs> it's odd looking. I mean, it, it, it looks, it looks wrong. I mean, cause the front half of the car is there. There is no back half of the car. It just tapers off to nothing. The inside is very beige, very boring, very absolutely boring. And uh, apparently, you know, people smile at it. That was the big part of the article. It's like, oh, I I test drove it. And the greatest part about it is everybody smiles at me. I think that these people are missing a market opportunity and they're marketing this thing completely wrong because they haven't sold that many yet. At $18,500, it is at a great price point. 
for people who are destined to be solo forever and are okay with that. This is the crowd that is okay when they go to the store and they buy 10 single serving microwave dinners and have them all lined up. They don't want to be with anybody. They want a car with one seat because nobody's going to ever ask them for a ride. Well, they a, never have to take their friends to the airport or help them move. Or they're not married. They don't have a kid. It's a one seater. Prime. I mean, this. I, I can see this could be a commuter car. I can totally see that, especially in a dense older city like Toronto. This would be a, a great way to get into work easy and quick. That's But that's the only use. You'd have to own another car for your freaking family. But here's the thing about it. It's not cool. It's fucking beige. Now, this thing has the potential to be huge, but it's got to be cool, you know? Because you, hey, you've already got the stigma that you're you're driving a solo. You are alone. You know the rest of society looks down on you for being a miserable person that is not adding anything to the gene pool already. But at least when you do it, you want to look fucking cool. I don't know if you remember at Epcot, they had these um, these little scooters that uh, basically kind of they were like motorcycles, but they were enclosed and they kind of swung as you drove them. I I I mean it's been, I was 18 when I saw the video for them. They might be gone now. I don't but remember. But those were cool. Okay. You don't remember it? No. Uh it was it was in the Florida one, so it it uh it was in Epcot, so. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you went there that much. I only went once, and that was a long yeah. time ago, so yeah. But they were cool. Now, I think if they take these and make them cool, man, you'd have a you'd they would be everywhere. Right. Turn them into Vespas, you know, something that you can customize and make your own and then end up in, you know, season two of the Book of Boba Fett or something. You it's can do something solo. with these. Make it look like the Millennium Falcon on the outside somehow. Seriously. Or Chewie giving you a big hug as he carries you to, the, to your office. Right. You know, something. You can do something with them. But uh, I, th I think that there is an opportunity here that they are missing. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Well, maybe they can hire you for marketing. See if they're on LinkedIn right. and they can send you a generic email <laughs> response saying your, your services are not required. Yes, I have a great N experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Board Ape Yacht Club creator Yuga Labs is investigating a phishing attack after a hacker stole nearly $2.5 million worth of NFTs through the official Board Ape Instagram account. So just if you're keeping count, pictures that you don't ever actually own were up on an Instagram account that somebody else, I guess, owns those picture, pictures and then somebody stole the pictures that you don't really own. And, oh, God. A little more complicated. A little more complicated than that. <laughs> well, basically Didn't what they, they did right was that they said that... No, no, no. Come on. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that basic. It was pretty close. Pretty close. They basically hacked the account and said, hey, there, there's going to be a new airdrop, which means that they can, if you, uh, if they have your wallet, they can drop something to your you know your wallet which like is the new U2 one album. of the big problems with nfts is you can people can send you nfts with smart contracts that can steal all your shit all the time mm -hmm. these people did the same thing but they hacked into the account and said hey this is an official drop that you can go be part of go attack attach your metamask wallet to it now and once they did that uh well yeah. there's your problem they stole the things that don't exist yeah exactly they did steal, steal the things that don't exist which happens i mean Every All week, the time. Every week, yes. It was almost. Yeah. I, I debated I mean, putting this in the news because it's like it's not news. This happens. It, it, there's probably been five five more since we started talking about it. There's a website that chronicles this beautifully. I recommend checking them out. <laughs> you know, we've only talked about them uh, two hundred times since it started. It was, the Web three is going great. Um, but you know, hey, if you don't want an ape NFT and you have a lot of money to burn, you can now get your home as an NFT when you buy from. Uh, uh, some Beverly Hills real estate agents. And uh, yeah, what they're doing is they're going to sell you a very expensive home. But for another $100,000, a mere $100,000, you can get a copy of your home in the metaverse. Is there a Where metaverse that, is, that we can go to no, yet? The metaverse? No, there isn't. Oh, interesting. There isn't. So, okay. Here's the deal. With $100,000, you get your own metaverse too. That's it. Okay. So well, less money yeah. than, than meta spent on it. Yeah. yeah, seriously. Okay. Uh, getting back to the physical world, someone left a prototype Google Pixel watch at a restaurant. Now we all remember back in 2010, well, I'm pretty sure we covered it on the podcast because we've been doing this forever. Apple software engineer Gray Powell left a prototype iPhone 4 in a bar in Redwood City, California. So that happened. 
And uh, now it was a fun the- time, though. Yeah, that was. come on. That was fun. Watching that in real time with uh, Steve Jobs sending the cops. Come on. <laughs> that was a good time. <laughs> it was time. great. This one's less fun. Uh, on Saturday evening, apparently uh, somebody left their watch in a restaurant in the U.S. and they were able to take uh, a lot of pictures of it and all that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, the software was not working. So they, we only see the phys- physical aspects. But OK, OK, hold on a second. I get losing your phone in a bar. Uh, you know, you and I maybe o- over partook many, many times in our youth and probably have left our phones in the bar before. But who the fuck takes off their watch at a restaurant? Especially if it's a prototype Google Pixel watch that you're supposed to probably be guarding with your life. I've had some very messy wings before, before and I've taken off my <laughs> ring, but I've never had to take my watch off when eating something. Yeah, B-dubs has not been known to uh, remove the Rolex, as they say. Here's here's what I'm guessing. The guy had it in his pocket or gal had it in their pocket and uh, it fell out. That's what I would guess. I suppose, yeah. But that's less fun. Well, we've had a lot of very hot talk about social media, this this in the news. And uh, I'm going to leave us with a big steaming cup of long-winded no shit by Jonathan Haidt. And I like Jonathan Haidt. He wrote uh, the, was it The Coddling of America? Yes. Something like that. Mm-hmm. Something. Uh, which is a decent book, decent book, uh, but also long-winded, uh, long-winded cup of no shit. This is the same thing. It's called Why the Past 10 Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid. It's Not Just a Phase by Jonathan Haidt. I read it. What did you think? I agree. Uh, but basically the headline is the entire story. That's exactly it. Well, actually, what he needed to say is because of social media. Oh, yes. Yes. If you add that phrase, you don't really even need to read the article. It's it's nothing it. we don't know having done this podcast and nothing you don't know having listened to this podcast. Thousands of words dedicated to the fact that social media is bad. Well, to be okay. fair, we've done 551 episodes. This episode is brought to you by Collide. Collide sends employees important, timely, and relevant security recommendations for their Linux, Mac, and Windows devices right inside Slack. Collide is perfect for organizations that care deeply about compliance and security, but don't want to get there by locking down devices to the point where they become unusable. Instead of frustrating your employees, Collide educates them about security and device management, like not leaving your watch in a restaurant, while directing them to fix important problems. Visit collide.com slash GOG. To sign up today, that's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash G-O-G. Enter your email when prompted to receive your free Collide gift bundle after trial activation. At Collide, we know end users are IT admins' most significant untapped resources and key to solving the most challenging to fix security issues, including instructing developers to set passphrases on unencrypted SSH keys, finding plain text two-factor backup codes and teaching end users how to store them securely, and convincing employees to uninstall evil browser extensions that may sell their browser history. Those are just some of the many use cases not solved by locking down devices. You can try Collide with all its features on an unlimited number of devices for free for 14 days with no credit card required. Try it out at collide.com slash GOG. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash G-O-G. Everyone needs a world-class VPN. Grumpy Old Geeks recommends private internet access to protect your online privacy and identity. Private internet access never keeps any records of their users' online activities, so you can be assured that you have complete privacy and nobody knows what you're doing online. No matter your technical skills, private internet access is one of the easiest VPN apps out there. All it takes to connect is just one click or tap and your data will be encrypted instantly. With just one private internet access VPN subscription, you can connect up to 10 devices at the same time. Go to GOG.show slash VPN and sign up today. For a limited time only, you can get our favorite VPN for just $2.69 a month when you sign up for two years. GOG.show slash VPN. That's GOG.show slash VPN. Media Candy. You and I did a, a surprisingly large amount of texting to each other this week. We we normally really don't speak much unless something big comes up or personal or whatever. But uh, you sent me yep. your Discovery Plus uh, login, as as we discussed on the last show. So I fired up my VPN. Allegedly. I allegedly sent it. Oh, yes. Allegedly. So I fired up my <laughs> uh, VPN and allegedly downloaded it because it's only available in the U.S., not in Canada. So U.S., here mm-hmm. I come. 
downloaded it, uh, allegedly logged in with your account and took a perusal because you had, to- you had told me that a bunch of the shows that you like were pretty much up to date with real-time broadcast. So I wanted to go see if the shows that I like were up to date with a real-time broadcast. And no, they are not. They are all still more than a year behind mm. with nothing newer than 2021 available in the app for my shows. So I deleted the alleged uh, account that I was using. So... Okay, then I will delete your alleged profile on alleged account. I mean, you can leave <laughs> so it. I don't have to look at know, it. But <laughs> whatever, oh, it doesn't matter. Funny. It's uh, the the stuff I want. I can't get to, so that's unfortunate. The other thing that you and I texted about uh, is what we said we weren't going to do, which we both said we're not going to watch the Bat Batman. And what did we do? We both tried to watch the Batman. Okay, did you finish watching the Batman? No, I gave up on the Batman because I found the Batman to be the boring. I went for a walk with my buddy Theo and uh, we were talking about the Batman and he had seen the Batman and wanted to discuss the Batman on one of our daily walks. So I said, "Okay, I'll finish the Batman. So the next night I did finish the Batman. Mm -hmm. And what did you think? Um, This movie did not need to be made. Like I said, (laughs) I did not need to watch this movie. Like I said, it was a waste of three hours. There were parts of the movie that I thoroughly enjoyed. I really liked the preternational movement that they gave the characters. I thought that was kind of cool with uh, Catwoman, how she kind of how she moved. Thought that was neat. They really could have afforded a few more songs for the goddamn soundtrack since there were only two in the entire movie. Yeah. Um, uh, They could have really done that. They assume, well, here's, here's the, way, the way it worked for me. They assumed that you knew too much backstory uh, as far as how the, the gangsters tied into the Batman story. Because if you haven't really read much about it or paid attention to things like the TV series Gotham, where you get really deep into the history, there's a lot of shit going on that you just wouldn't know and you have to figure out. So they right. didn't do a lot of good character development. I thought the guy that played Batman, the tw- twinkly guy or whatever his name is, I thought he was fine. Robert I had no Patterson. problem with him. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he would have been a fine Batman if it would have been a, an interesting movie, but it wasn't. So, you know. No, th- that's the problem. It really wasn't. And a friend uh, of mine sent me a YouTube link, and you know my policy about people sending me YouTube links is I never watch them, but I did watch this one, and uh, it, it fixes the, I think it fixes the entire movie, Jason. It's the Batman, it does. but with goofy Batman, meaning Adam West yes. Batman, <laughs> overlaid into the movie, and it's hilarious. I loved it. These guys are top notch. Mm-hmm. And I don't, did, I don't know if you dug into who they are very much. Did you get a chance to look at them? Uh, I, I looked at some, but at that point, you know, my YouTube tolerance had already waned, so I didn't watch anymore. All right. These are the guys that did the, uh, the fix on Luke Skywalker from The Mandalorian. Right. They basically, the last scene where Luke shows up and then after the show ends, somebody goes, hey, uh, let me fix that for you. And then they just redid it. Mm-hmm. These are the guys that redid it. So... And they, there's, you got to check out their channel. There is a ton of videos that they do that are just funny as hell. Like the R-rated Spider-Man, where Spider-Man just keeps dying. And it's like part of a Loki uh, scenario. It, I was cracking up. It's hilarious. But these guys are really, really good. I mean, really, really good. Yeah. And speaking of something that I was told was really, really good, but I found also not to be really, really good at all. Our Flag Means Death, uh, an HBO Max. Uh, theoretically, it's a comedy series. I watched long and hard for any comedy. I suppose if I were a five-year-old boy that had ne- never seen Monty Python, uh, this might be funny. It's not. Oh, boy, is it It's not. terrible. It's terrible. I mean, it is terrible. Like, uh, nothing has terrible. the right to be that bad that has been <laughs> made and lots of money is being spent on. It is absolutely horrifically bad. I'm sure it's probably already picked up for three seasons. I'd, I'd imagine it's so. Taika Waititi, or what? I think that's his name. How yes, you pronounce which, it. You know, it's uh, him. He seems pretty talented in other venues, but God, this is bad. I mean, I, I thought he was funny in other movies, but mm-hmm. this just does not. This does not deliver. I mean, I tried. I watched the whole first episode, and I'm like, I get, I get what they're going for. Yeah. I totally get it. And there are probably some people out there that think it's the funniest shit on the planet. I'm just not one of them. Right. I agree. Uh, I ended up watching something on Netflix out of desperation or boredom. Uh, I watched the first episode of the S- Supergirl series, and I actually found it to be quite delightful. Okay. I thoroughly enjoyed one episode. I don't know if I'll ever go back, but it's media candy, and I needed to put something in here. It was very good. Is this good. one of those WB series? I believe it is. 
It's yeah. uh, Melissa Ben whatever is Supergirl, and there's really good casting. Like the previous Supergirl from the movies plays the mom, and like uh, there's all kinds of cameos and weird fun stuff. But I actually found it to be a genuinely delightful little story, at least in the first mm-hmm. episode. So look, those those WB shows that do the uh, do the superheroes like they did Gotham, they did uh, the Arrow or just Arrow, which I, I enjoyed. I, they do a really good job. It's high production value, mediocre storylines, but they're mm-hmm. watchable. Yeah. I think they're totally watchable. And that's how I know so much history about the Batman is because I watched <laughs> Gotham. Right. You know, back when Jada Pinkett Smith was somewhat tolerable, I guess. All right. Uh, I've been trying to watch Severance on Apple TV Plus. OK. Have you have you tried? Uh, I was going to give it a go. Realized that there's so many other shows that I haven't caught up with yet, so I didn't do it. And then I saw so much uh, like backlash about the ending of the show, so I figured, why? Well, see, I saw that people were actually talking about the ending. That means somebody watched it to the end, right? So I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll give it a go. I'm on episode five, mm-hmm. and most of it is, you know. It's just background. You just let it go because they're walking around hallways and shit for I mean, there were five minutes in the first episode that I fast forward that they were walking around hallways with nobody in them. Yeah, it's it's very slow, obviously, very uncomfortable, not very funny. I thought it was supposed to be a comedy. There's not very funny. Right. Very much like our flag means death. So I'm going to I'm going to get through it. I'm going to hate watch it to the end because I want to see what the ending is. Right. But for the most part, I'm it's it's tough. It's tough. It's really tough. <laughs> Definitely off my list. Yeah, I really wouldn't recommend uh, doing what I'm doing with it. I caught one of the videos of Danny Elfman mm-hmm. at Coachella. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. And at first, because at first I was like, is that an old video? And because he didn't have a shirt on and he was ripped. And I'm like, wait a minute. How old is Danny Elfman? 68. He looks, shouldn't be looking that good. He looks better than he did when Oingo Boingo was a going thing. I know. This is what money does. They dip him in the money and he comes out looking young. It's a money bath. Yeah. I, I think he really has found the things from Cocoon. <laughs> he, he must have. Yeah, he looks great. Yeah. In going down this road, I found that he's apparently not sharing it with his wife, though, because he's married to Bridget Fonda and Bridget Fonda does not look that great. No, but Bridget Fonda looks like a pretty typical, normal 58-year-old woman that's had kids. Yeah. That's the thing. But she quit. Like, she walked away from Hollywood a long time ago, so good on her. Yeah, and there was a car accident as well that was involved. But, uh, I mean, it just seems so sad. It seems so sad when you go back and watch watch Point of No Return. People get older, Jason. Uh, It happens. Shut up. You're ruining it. (laughs) Hey, she's she's always going to be in those old movies. Looking just the way she did back then, which was smoking hot. I need 15 minutes alone and a copy of Jackie Brown. I'll be right back. Those denim shorts. My God. Ups and doodads. I noticed, Brian, that I only keep the cash app on my phone because I get little hits of happy every time it shows one of the alerts that says Bitcoin has fallen 5% in the past hour. Yeah, it's amazing how we nobody talks about Bitcoin all the time anymore. It's just there. Um, I still have some money in it, and I see that it goes up a couple hundred bucks, then it goes down a couple hundred bucks, then it goes back up a couple hundred bucks, then it goes back down a couple hundred bucks, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my 250 bucks in uh, Ethereum, which was worth 230 by the time I got my first transaction fees done, uh, hovers a little under 200 now. And the, the thing is, it's like I'm just leaving it there because yeah, I'm like... Me too. I don't want to go through the hassle of taking it out. And I, I, exa- more I'm money too lazy. It. Exactly. I'm yeah. too lazy to cash it out. So I'll just let it sit there. And if it ever actually goes up a big bump again, and all of a sudden we have to put up with all the bit bros again, I'll pull it out then. Yeah. I'm keeping the ETH just because one day I'll get off my ass and actually mint an NFT just to have one. Right. Just to say, because it's basically just probably going to be uh, that picture of Tyler Durden from uh, Fight Club that says, fuck you on it. Right. <laughs> That'll because you can take somebody else's artwork and make an nft i don't know if you know that brian i i was i was aware that that could happen i know i know that they they you thought that they engineered around it but uh I, you know, sadly it, well it, it, but it's on the blockchain jason it's secure and private it secure <laughs> you will own it forever no one can take it away from you i was t- i was listening to my wife uh, yesterday because she is unfortunately she bemoans this she's become the nft queen over at her job um so she deals no, with no. legal issues and she has to bring uh, other people up to speed on it sometimes. And she, 
she's just oh, like no. she's like it's just a link but it's not even a link they don't own the link they don't own the image they don't own anything you're buying a receipt they just own the right to say that they own it that's it uh, does she have to I, I i feel really bad if she has to do this to the artist as well does she have to explain nfts to the artist uh no because all they care about is money gotcha so it's just the managers so like does it make money okay cool there great <laughs> let's do it and she was <laughs> i don't even know if well i'm not saying the names of anything so i guess i'm okay i overheard her the other day where she was screaming about like some other company she's like we're not doing a deal with them they haven't even sold one yet not oh one <laughs> Don't these people know that you're supposed to pump and dump them before the public can even see them? So they have a, a Some trail? people Jeez. are trying to actually make it into a legit business. I don't know why. <gasps> That's like taking bank robbery and trying to make it legit. Well, Pinterest exists. That's true. That's true. So I've been thinking a lot about technology and how we bemoan it and how it's so terrible and everything breaks and blah, blah, blah. And I get I get texts all the time. This damn iPhone 13, what a piece of crap! You know, my text, uh, it, it, what I type doesn't come out right. Uh, autocorrect, blah blah blah. Yeah. And then I'm just thinking this week as I'm as I'm sitting there playing with my phone and my iPads because I'm trying to get real. I'm trying to figure out every feature that is. I'm trying to become the power user for iOS and iPad OS. Okay. And I'm just it just fascinates. I'm sitting there going. This is the most amazing technology that is just, it is incredible when you think about what we grew up with mm -hmm. and what we have now. I know it's a, it's a story as old as time, but every now and again, you get that moment where you're like, holy shit, this is cool. And the moment that I had, I had two, two different moments with it this week with Apple technology. And it's not even, it, well, some of it's fairly new. Uh, actually, I guess both of them are new, but uh, the live text feature where basically any photo with text in it becomes copyable and pasteable mm -hmm. is incredible to have that everywhere. Except I use it all the lest time. I remind you the one time you sent me something for me to copy and paste from an image to test it. It didn't work. It works great now. I think they fixed it. Okay. Cause it, what I use it all the time for is people post links like an in Instagram and I'm like, okay, well I can't click that because it's Instagram, but I can do a quick screenshot, copy, paste it, delete the screenshot, paste it back into Safari. Boom. Done. You know, it's just built in now. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the old days, that would be like groundbreaking technology that you could sell an entire company on. Now it's just a side feature, you know? Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And then universal control is just, it's just freaky magic with the fact that you can control an iPad that's just sitting next to your Mac just automatically works that your mouse and your keyboard, once you just drag your mouse over to it, actually controls the iPad. Nothing, you don't have to do anything. I, I had to do that before. I had to buy a $150 dongle to do it. Right. And now it just happens. Now it just it happens. Is, it's magic. It's just, it's, I, I'm sorry. I just had one of those weeks where technology seemed really fucking cool to me. <laughs> I, I long for that. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to get to the point where I wanted to throw it through a window in a second, but I also want to point out that Apple's self-service repair uh, shenanigans, they're now online and you can actually... Get stuff from Apple to fix your own phone if you want. That's great. Yeah. And I looked through some of the, I looked through the catalog and you can buy like, you know, the big equipment, you know, the vacuum sealers and the heating elements and all that crap. If you spent like, you know, probably like three or four grand, you could set up your own repair shop. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. But the other thing that really caught my eye was you'll be able to rent the kits for 49 bucks for a week if you don't want to buy all the stuff. So you can, you know, rent the kit and just buy the glass and the display or whatever you're or the camera, whatever you're going to replace, but you can rent the kit that has all the gear to do it yourself, which is really cool. Yeah, I is. think that is actually really cool. They're like kind of doing it right. I agree. That's great. Now let's get to the technology that made me want to throw it through the fucking window. <laughs> yes. I, I am now a gagillionaire. So I have, I have gigabit fiber. So if there's any problems with latency or bandwidth on the show, it's your fault. <laughs> Not mine. I checked it this morning. I got 970 up, 970 down. That's uh, good. Etherneted directly to the router. Yep. Now, this router is on the opposite side of the house as the previous router. Literally, the as far as you can get on the premises apart. Right. Because when I talked to the technician, he's like, you want to keep the router as close to the fiber point as possible because you don't, because it is fiber. It literally is... Uh, a fiber coming from the pole to the router and you want to minimize that. So I put it as close to the pole as possible, which means it's the other end of the house where all the action happens like the TVs and stuff like that. So 
my old Eero wouldn't cut the mustard. Because the old Eero doesn't do gigabit speed. So right. I had to go look and say, oh, God, i got to upgrade and find out what does gigabit mesh. And I wanted to stick with Eero because I kind of like it. Yeah. So I found the Eero Pro 6. Yes, I have the, one. The Pro version. You got the Pro version? I have the Pro version. Okay. So I got three of them. The three pack for $479, which hurt a lot because I had an Eero system already. And I uh, set it up. Got nice line of sight from out in the garage where I'm at, through a window, another 50 feet to another window to where the next router is inside the house, and then another router at the far end of the house. Okay. Seems logical, right? Mm -hmm. I got about 75 megabits in the living room, which is about seven feet from one of the routers. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. I went from 970 to the 70s. And I'm like, yeah, you lost 900 there. What? Where did they go? I am literally going through a window. There is no through the windows, through the walls. There's no walls in this. Is that triple glazed? Uh, double. It's double glazed. <laughs> They're brand new. They're nice. But still, they should not have 900 megabit blocking capability they are not you know uh faraday, cage faraday windows, windows. <laughs> yeah they're not faraday windows so i i'm like okay what's going on so i i unplugged one to see if i could move it and see if i could figure out what was going on when i unplugged that one my bandwidth went from 70 to 400 okay and i'm like wait a second i just made this system this mesh system less robust and now it goes faster and then I'm like, okay, so I'm, I, I, I'm like, this has to be a fluke. Okay, I'm going to plug yeah. the other router back in in a different part of the house. Went down to 200 after I plugged it back in. Came up, but went to 200. So I've got this three router problem right now, and I'm trying to figure out the three body exactly problem. how this thing works. Yes, it's exactly like the three body problem. I'm like, what is the orbit that I have to figure out how these things are going to work in? And it's maddening. And what it turned out was I'm stuck inside the house at 250. I can't get above 250 in the house because if you have three, three pro routers, it sucks. If you plug in an old school beacon, the mm -hmm. old beacons that they have yeah. to place around the house, mm -hmm. it brings everything back up to the max that those can do because those can't do gigabit, but they can do about 250 megabits. Right. So now I'm I'm like, okay, well, the house is at 250. The office where I work, where I'm talking to you is a gigabit. I can live with that. Okay. Only cost 500 bucks to find out that I have to still use all my old Eero shit <laughs> in the first place. So I could have saved the 500 bucks, used the old Eero system. It would have been just fine and just etherneted from the get-go. Fun times. Thanks. Thanks, Eero. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that really worked out. The other option is to just have two, two Pro 6 routers, but the far, far reaches of the house and the, and the rooms that have walls, it just won't penetrate. So you have to, like, you have to go down to go up. Yep. It's annoying. That's all I got to say. It's really annoying. <laughs> but I did pick up a new piece of tech again that I really actually liked, which is the Sonos Roam. Mm-hmm. Uh, since summer's coming, we like to spend more time outside and spend out now that I'm just in recovery from the stroke thing. I spend a lot of time outside with the dogs reading and just trying to relax and there's no music outside. And then I saw that, oh, Sonos has this new one. So I, I picked it up and I checked it out and the sound quality, it's okay. Here's about the size is about the same as the JBL yeah. uh, portable speaker yep. that you hooked me up with. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit smaller. But sounds just as good. Cool. The thing can punch out sound. It's incredible how much sound this thing can can actually spit out. It's set up just like a regular Sonos. Got it on the system. Um, the, the switch over from the old Eero system to the new Eero system for an entire mixed Sonos setup took half a day. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. I, what I do recommend is if you have old Sonos machines... Throw them away and just buy the new ones because the new ones work so much better yeah. than the old ones. They're great. They're they're really great. The sound's amazing. Oh, they're so good. They are really just, they sound so good, but the setup on the old ones, they'll just fall off the network. Then you have to unplug them, reset them, get an ethernet cable if you can still find one, plug them in, go through the setup. It is a nightmare. The new ones, all Bluetooth. It's great. Yeah. Super easy setup. I had no problems at all setting them up in our office. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. 
So I figured out where some of those billions of dollars that Meta is spending is gone. They're opening up their first physical store as of May 9th. The Meta Store. Can you say write off? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> it's a write off. The Meta Store opens May 9th in Burlingham, California, which is close to the headquarters for Meta's Reality Labs division. They will showcase the company's VR headsets, Ray Ban stories, glasses, and portal devices, and will offer interactive demos for shoppers. Yay! So, just to be clear, a company that's betting its rather sizable farm on the non physical metaverse is opening up a brick and mortar. You know, you just can't make this shit up. And then Vincent sent us uh, some uh, some link here, which is actually, I thought was really good. He says, fellas, came across this list of useful websites. I didn't subscribe, just scrolled down to see the list. Cheer.ag sounds like a perfect match for Dave, tip of my tongue, Bittner. Also, Chirag is an Indian name. And it's uh, insanelyuselwebsites.com, which kind of does exactly what it says on the tin. There's some pretty cool stuff in there. Uh, you know, as per usual with these these sorts of things, I will never, never, never remember to go to any of these sites when I need to because you you know the need to do th these sorts of things is very rare but it's cool and there's a lot of cool stuff in there definitely so thank you Vincent yeah it's a good list it's a really good list um probably want to sign up for the newsletter yeah I'd imagine they roll new ones out pretty often yeah there's a lot of stuff in here I'd already I already knew about but there's a lot of stuff I didn't which is really cool and here's another piece of technology that uh really kind of got me this week that uh just to go back to my God, this shit's just so cool and it's everywhere now. There's a site in here called Clean PNG, uh, where you can yeah. go find PNGs without backgrounds. But there's another one called Remove.bg, which will just take the background out of an image. And now it's just a feature in all of the stuff we have. What's what's that one AR app that we got? Clip app. We take a picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and it just it takes it and puts it right into Photoshop if you've got it running. It's, it's just insane how amazing it is. How much time did you and I spend taking backgrounds out in Photoshop? in the in the old day oh i, I mean, know and I, I use it every week almost every week for our show art i'll always grab something and uh, pull out the background so yeah great. and and honestly nowadays you almost don't even need that because if you have uh subject selection in photoshop it just kind of does it mm -hmm. i've been taking some photoshop uh tutorials on skillshare and the stuff that you can do in photoshop so easy nowadays I mean, I recommend just taking a, a, like an hour or two and get up to speed with the new features. Yeah. Oh my God. It's magic what you can do. I mean, it's, in, it's incredible. So it's just another one of those things where it's like what used to be insanely hard is just so just, this just happens now. It's yeah. like, oh, I don't want a background. Click a, literally just click a button. What used to take us hours. I love it. At the library. Brian, remember when I took uh, some time off from uh, Clash Royale? Yes. I think I took February off or March. One of those months. I took a month off. And in the time that I had off, I read Sandman, finally. Mm -hmm. Finished it. And I should have gotten it done sooner because it would have been a big anchor taken off me. Um, I recommend, uh, I still recommend reading it. It's it's well worth it. Uh, I, there's a link in the show notes to the Sandman Omnibus, which is a beautiful physical version of it. You can get it on Comixology if you want, but the Sandman is one of those things where I recommend just owning a physical copy because <laughs> you should. Uh, except for you, because you hate it. It'd be like exactly. me owning the complete Anne Rice yeah. or Stephen King collection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just you know, not there. Um, I went back and I was uh, re-listening to The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward by Daniel Pink. Uh, I think I covered it on the show before the first time I, I went through it, but kind of gave it a, a glancing recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of the same. I'm still trying to figure out really what he's trying to say in this book. I don't know if I can recommend it. It's just, it's kind of all over the place. Dan Pink, you know, he's been around forever but um, isn't basically the entire book couldn't it just be learned from your past kind of yeah i think it kind okay. of says it in the title <laughs> the power of regret how looking backward moves us forwards okay yeah. tried that Learn didn't work mistakes. won't do that again yeah uh and i've also been uh, listening to the art of impossible a peak performance primer primer by stephen kotler uh, i find stephen hit or miss with some of his stuff this is a pretty good Pretty good book, though. I, yeah. I do like it. it. It talks about flow, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of tips and tricks for getting into flow, which I, I have been taking a lot of notes from because I, since I stopped coding, I don't really have a good 
flow outlet. We don't get into flow when we're doing this show by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, some, I, I can get into it when I'm editing, you know, I can, I can lose a day in editing, mm -hmm. which is, it's rare to get in flow with editing because half the time I'm just screaming at it. I'm like, why are you talking into the microphone sideways? Um, but sometimes you can really get into it if it's a good show. Yeah. But this is a it's a, I, I recommend this book over the power of regret. This actually has some good science in it. Stephen I does love a good being job with to, the science. Yeah, I love being able to get into flow. It's uh, that's also another thing about like um, work from home. Really, um, it can be difficult at home because you have distractions. But I also find it difficult in the office now because uh, you have distractions. So for me, like my flow period is like kids gone to bed. Wife is upstairs watching TV. I'm working downstairs at night, and I can really get into get into flow there, which is great. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need yeah. you need that time. That's mm -hmm. I mean that's the biggest upside for going to the office for me is you know well, you have an empty office. Door. Yeah, exactly. I do not except for all the people who aren't inviting me to the damn meetings, <laughs> walking down the halls. But. Yeah, uh, I'm still working on a sci-fi book, but I did get a cookbook in the interim, which I actually thought was really good. It's The Milk Street Fast and Slow, Instant Pot Cooking at the Speed You Need by Christopher Kimball. Uh, the Instant Pot is one of the greatest inventions in modern history. It's phenomenal for cooking, and there are a gazillion great recipes in this book. Now, my wife found this book and purchased it uh, on her Kindle. Okay. We tried to figure out a way to share it to my Kindle app in my kindle account mm -hmm. you can you can go through a convoluted process and uh, i can it can be loaned to me temporarily for up to seven days on my kindle and then she cannot access it on her kindle the other thing i learned is you cannot print from kindle books so if i find a recipe that i want i like to have it printed and not have my ipad in the kitchen with me you cannot do that can you screenshot it well that is what I'm going to do next. Now that I've got your <laughs> tips and I know that that is working again, I have, I think I have found a solution. So we shall see, but uh, it's just been so like, it's so insane that you cannot print from the Kindle. You can't, it's dumb. Well, it's copyright. It's I know. My, I know you book. just bought the book. It's my you book. Bought the book. <laughs> yep. But you also can't take your book into a Kinko's and copy it. So, well, you can't do that because there's no Kinko's anymore. That's true. That's true. Uh, well, I think the lesson, the takeaway lesson from this is to stick to physical cookbooks. I, I don't I think, think we're, so too. we're never going to buy them on a Kindle again. No, I mean, I, I have the Pestle app and I still use that, which is, which is really handy to remind me yeah. to print out the recipe later and keep it in the kitchen. I have, yeah, we have a bookshelf that one, one row is, you know, cookbooks and printed recipes. So, but Pestle is great for uh, just getting it, putting it into a, a decent format and printing it. Because, yeah, I, yeah. I think cookbooks need to be physical for sure. Yep. Closing shout outs. Over at Patreon, we've got some new subscribers. We've got Skultis. I believe that might be how you pronounce it. Maybe not. Let me know. And Aaron. And we got a message from Davi. He says, hey, grumpies. It's great to be part of this community. About the DNS discussion in episode 550, I usually ping Quad9, OpenDNS, and Google from the network I will use because the latency varies by geolocation, ISP, etc. And I only use it as an upstream DNS resolver with DNSSEC to prevent spoofing on the local DNS server, often a pie hole. I hope this time I have given enough arguments so Brian starts working on his two years forgotten multinational project that is collecting dust in his Canadian shed. <laughs> Stay safe and grumpy. You know, it's funny because I brought brought this up a little bit i was talking about the you know the dns services on our discord channel as well and everybody keeps going on and on about pie hole pie hole pie hole not gonna happen i've given up on it it's never gonna happen so say i and i'll just i'll throw this in really quickly i was gonna do this in security but uh you know dave isn't here and we're pulling that for a bit so uh i did try cloudflare's dns uh and it sucked it was horrible. Okay. Um, I, I had lots of problems with particularly like with Google AMP articles or anything coming off uh, social media. It just did not work. So I tried Quad9. Uh, works like a dream. It's great. So I'm on Quad9 now. Yeah, I saw you said that. So I went and set mine for Quad9 and I've had no problems whatsoever. So it seems a little snappier than Google's. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, we got another message from Jared over on Patreon as well, who sent a link, uh, Fort Worth to become first city to mine Bitcoin. Apparently Fort Worth, Texas has decided they needed to jump in the Bitcoin pool. Um, good luck. 
Fort Worth? Yeah, they say Texas is increasingly being recognized as the global leader in Bitcoin and blockchain, and Fort Worth will have a seat at that table. I've been to Fort Worth. Fort Worth sucks. Sorry. Apologies to our Fort Worth listeners. Trust me, if they live in Fort Worth, they know it sucks. Yeah. Over at PayPal, we got donations from Mark Humphrey, Charlie Breed, Thomas, and Aaron, who sent us a whopping 50 bucks. Thank you. And over at our tip jar, we've got Brett, Ashley, Daryl, and Adam. Thank you all so very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, No new reviews this week. Sadness. Oh, well. And uh, again, quick shout out to Dave and the entire Bittner clan. Our thoughts are with you. Until next time, I'm Brian Schulmeister. And I'm Jason DeFilippo. Thanks for listening to Grumpy Old Geeks. If you enjoyed the show, visit GOG.show slash donate to help us keep the lights on and we'll love you forever. You can also help us out by sharing the show with your friends and enemies, especially the enemies. Screw those guys. It's easy and absolutely free. Just look for that little share button in the podcast player you're listening to us on right now. Show notes for this episode are at GOG.show slash 551. From there, you can find links to everything we talked about in this episode, as well as links to our swag and Discord channel if you want to buy some stuff or chat with us and other show fans. You can also head over to GOG.show slash contact and send us your feedback or questions that we can read on the air. And if you're so inclined, please head over to GOG.show slash review and toss us a snarky review and preferably five stars. Stay grumpy!